Hey, everybody. Welcome to Dakari's 29th virtual fire investigative training session. Uh, today, we have ATF Special Agent Certified Fire Investigator Darren Solomon. And Darren is out of the uh, Charlotte, North Carolina ATF office. And today, he's going to talk to us about firefighter fatality protocols and line of duty death investigations. So, Darren, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I really do appreciate the invitation to to give this uh, little talk, it's something I'm very passionate about, and uh, that'll be evident as I start going through the slides why I uh, put this together, but I really do appreciate this, and I uh, uh, hope you get a lot out of it. So the reason, oh. well, Bill, you may want to stop the record. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Basically, this is going to give you some tips. A lot of this focuses on things that you can do beforehand, uh, things that I want you to be aware of, all of uh, the complexity, the inner workings, the multitude of things that are going on. And by having some of those kind of pre-planned conversations, you can really get in front of this. So, I mean, that's what we're going to do. First, we're going to talk about why do we even talk about this in the first place? Um, Within the fire service, I've noticed that uh, in every profession like this, there are some taboo subjects that just really don't get addressed. Uh, you know, I've seen where fire setting in the fire service uh, is kind of swept or pushed to the side, um, self-medicating with either alcohol or with drugs because of all of the traumatic stuff that we see doing our jobs is another issue. But LODD is one that I've, I've really taken an interest in because I will ask whether it's investigators or it's fire command, like, do you have an LODD policy? And almost everyone universally does. But then I'll ask, okay, when was the last time you as a command staff sat down and went over it? Um, a lot of them can't give me an answer. It's like, we got it, but I don't know the last time we actually went over it line by line. And, and in that time, how many people have retired? How many people have been promoted up into that chain of command? Uh, it, it's something that you really, really need to talk about. It's, it's way more than just funeral protocols and family liaison and, and all of that. So it's something that I really want to get command structures to start, start talking about. Th then we're going to talk about what you can expect when one of these happens. So just for your understanding, uh, what I'm going to focus on mainly today is going to be the May Day, uh, a fire ground LODD. Not to say that one that comes in a training environment or one that comes, uh, you know, as you're responding in a traffic accident, that those are any less tragic. Obviously, they are. But this is that perfect storm whenever you have the uh, collapse or you have the disoriented firefighter in a structure that gets lost and you have to go in and try to save them or at least recover them. And then we're going to talk about the steps to take, you know, who, who must you call? Cause there are going to be agencies that you must notify uh, who should you call and who could you call? So you got three different tiers there. So that's kind of the game plan with what we're going to look at. And I, I talked uh, earlier about my passion about this. Uh, these patches are from, uh, departments here in the Charlotte field divisions. So it's North and South Carolina. Uh, these have all experienced LODDs. Uh, pretty much everyone's familiar with Charleston, South Carolina in the lower right corner, uh, the Super Sofa Fire. Uh, Charleston actually brought me in. I was very humbled. They brought me in just to go over this policy as a refresher last year. Salisbury Fire Department's my hometown. That's where I grew up. Uh, I was actually in Salisbury when the Millwork Fire happened and two firefighters there lost their lives. And in Pineville and Asheville, uh, again, both line of duty deaths, they were singular which was rare because in both of those instances, it was for by the grace of God that those were not multi-fatality LODDs as well. So being on the national response team, you know, not only did I see these four right here and some of the missteps or some of the problems that were encountered, but being on the national response team, we very often go to LODDs across the country. I know recently we've been in Chicago, we've been in Buffalo. And when you start seeing these, these missteps in various places across the country, then you know it's not a regional problem or a, a department specific problem. It's more of a, a, a universal problem. So that's why we're trying to get this information out to people. The biggest thing is this, you know, just uh, like when that, that gate opens on that uh, troop carrier and you hit the, the water to go in, pre-planning matters, okay? Uh, having those pre-conversations, 
having those predefined roles will make a huge impact when you have to work one of these events because there's already built in stress. You've got a lot of uh, things going on to make it simpler for you to navigate that situation. The pre-planning is crucial. And you think about it. I mean, if you've got a unique location in your district, you've got a stadium or a hospital, a chemical factory, then you already have a pre-plan. If something goes wrong at that location, what you're going to do. I, I guarantee you, you have a pre-plan for active shooter or a mass casualty event with uh, the frequency that we're seeing with those events nowadays. But do you have a pre-plan of what to do, who to involve, what steps to take when one of our own goes down? Okay, that's one of the things I wanna encourage because a firefighter fatality, I mean, we've all been on fire fatality scenes. Um, we, we know how complex they can be, but think about it when it's one of our own, it's a perfect storm. Uh, so, that detachment we have on a traditional fatality. Now it's somebody that we may have gone to church with, our kids may play Little League together. That, that shock we see in civilian victims, we're now, we're now uh, encountering. So to have that pre-plan and to have that, that defined role and knowing what's coming will really get you ahead of the curve. The great thing about you being here is we like to consider that you will be a force multiplier. So, you know, the, the plans, the tactics, all the, uh, the things that go on during an LODD, you know, I want you to go back and share with your department or share with other departments in your area, because obviously not everybody can be on this and, and, and see it at one time. So we want, you know, to give you that information and you in turn go back, go out in your respective areas and share that with your departments, with your commands, so that this word gets out and everybody's not waiting for it to happen. They know what to do when it happens. Because when everybody knows their role, it prevents a lot of confusion. Uh, we've all seen that situation where there's a little bit of a, either a, a leadership vacuum or some lack of movement. Uh, when you've got that vacuum, sometimes a person that steps up and says, hey, I'm in charge, mm, not always should be the person in charge. So when you've got that defined leadership because the chief's gonna have his hands full, the assistant chiefs are going to have their hands full. You're going to see that there is no way one person can handle all of this. So having those defined roles and defined tasks will really help immensely. Now let's talk a little bit about why this is important. So uh, United States Fire Administration puts out an annual report about firefighter fatalities for statistics ranging from uh, age of uh, the fallen to where they're at and anything like that. So the 2020 report is the most recent. Uh, you'll see down there that so far this year, uh, as of yesterday when I checked, the United States has had 27 on duty, line of duty deaths. And that's ranging from anything at the May day out of the scene, traffic accident, training, whatever. But 27 so far for 2023. Uh, the last complete report was 2022, and that had 102 in it. And you'll see that one caveat that 36 were attributed to COVID, but 102 was the number for, for 2022. And then let's break this down. So out of that 102, 49 were career firefighters, 44 were volunteers, and nine were wildland. Uh, I know when you start looking at those categories below, you know, I'm no math genius, but I know that 72 plus 29 plus 26, obviously that doesn't add up to 102, but some of those categories do overlap. So that's why the numbers uh, don't add up to a clean 102, but that's, that's what we're looking at. Everything from, uh, you know, died from activities on a fire scene, uh, died from activities related to the emergency incident, uh, seven died in training. So that kind of gives you an overview of how the 102 uh, were categorized. The good thing about this chart, also courtesy of the U.S. Fire Administration, is you see that downward gradient. Uh, and that's what we want. That's, I mean, obviously, ideal situation is we have zero. But in reality, we know it's a dangerous profession. So having that trend go down, I think the high water mark was in 2013, obviously, where you had 110. But since then, we've been able to drop. Uh, I think we got to 2019 that there was 60, it's 62 or 63. Uh, you see a little bit of that uptick. Now, I just pointed out that there was 102. What the USFA did was they removed those COVID deaths. 
so it wouldn't be an anomaly to keep it with the true numbers. But again, we, we like that downward trend and pushing it as low as we can get. So why do we need to talk about this? You know, what do we need to do? Well, number one, rarity makes us inefficient at things. You can tie your shoes upside down, in the dark, underwater, it doesn't matter. You do it once, if not multiple times in a day, the repetition makes it almost muscle memory. You could do it anytime, anywhere. But think about it, like if you've gone to Ikea and got a piece of furniture and tried to put it together for the first time, you need a PhD and a lot of patients are alcohol. So when it's something that you've never done, then you know that unaware uh, aspect, is, is, is there's a built-in learning curve. And thankfully, we don't want these to be common where we get to automatic repetition. We want them to be rare, if, if at all. But again, not doing them when they do happen kind of puts us behind the curve because we're not you know, really familiar with them and how to navigate them. As I said earlier, it's one of us. Uh, so again, on a traditional fatality, you know, we see family members having to navigate that shock. Well, when it's one of us, we're experiencing the same thing because we're human beings too. So that adds a level of complexity, uh, cuts down on some clear thinking, sometimes some decision-making uh, that, that we don't see on a traditional fire fatality. The other thing is firefighting, it's a collective endeavor, okay? Firefighters usually die in clusters. Anyway, the slide before, or a couple of slides before, you saw the Charleston Nine. There were two in Salisbury, but they almost lost the, uh, a RIT team. Uh, in both Asheville and in um, the other one in Pineville, you know, they were singular, but again, there were other disoriented firefighters that had to be rescued. So it's not like a state trooper who pulls over a DWI suspect, you know, at 2 a.m. You know, that's more of a singular duty with firefighting and you know what goes into fighting structure fires. It's a collective event. So when something goes wrong, it usually involves multiple people. And here's the other thing, you know, people want to help, uh, you know, cops and firefighters always you know, jostle each other and pick back and forth. And cops are always saying, I should have been a firefighter. Everybody loves firefighters, but, but especially in one of these events, people want to help, but sometimes good intentions don't equal good results. Sometimes people get in the way. Sometimes they kind of mess up the system of what needs to be done. So you got to, you don't want to push that love and that that passion for what you know we're going through away. But what you do want to do is kind of guide them and corral so that those coming to bring stuff for food or those coming in to offer support or whatever they're doing, there's an avenue for them to do that and that uh, everything can still move forward. Basic three points of why we need to do this. Okay, number one is justice for the fallen. So when one of these happens, if that fire was an arson and a firefighter dies, then that's murder, pure and simple. That's homicide. Uh, we do not want to do something that gives any prosecutor, or any kind of uh, solicitor, the you know, where they say, well, I would like to prosecute this, but, and that but being a mistake that we made or didn't do, or uh, we did something wrong. We don't want to be the person that may stand in the way of that family getting justice for their beloved. So we want justice for our brothers and sisters. The other thing is this, we wanna ensure benefits, okay? So you will see there are agencies that you have to call. We don't wanna either fail to do those or not do it in a timely manner where we're delaying benefits or God forbid, even giving someone justification to not pay benefits to that surviving family. And then the last thing is transparency. Uh, it's a big buzzword nowadays. Everybody wants transparency. Everybody knows how to do our job better than we do. So when you start talking about a line of duty death investigation, I mean, something obviously had to go wrong. Usually it's a cascading of bad events. So something led to something else and led to something else. There's going to be blame. So who's going to cast that blame and who's going to, because uh, I will tell you right now, there are attorneys who specialize in suing fire departments uh, when one of these happens. Uh, we, we think of ourselves as a big family, but these lawyers will go after somebody. They'll try to find that one family member and they'll tell them, hey, because of either bad tactics or bad leadership or bad equipment, that's the reason your beloved is dead and they need to be held accountable. 
And that family is very, very vulnerable at that moment. So again, transparency is, is key is when you, you get start getting into the who's responsible for the event. So we're going to talk about mainly two investigations. The ONC, which I'll also call on occasion the, the criminal investigation, it, it's a singular event, just like it is on every fire that we go and investigate. And the other one's going to be the line of duty death investigation. Think, think to yourself, what exactly is an LODD investigation? You know, who does it? Is there one? I actually, to be honest with you, it's multifaceted. There's going to be a number of those doing line of duty death investigations. So that's kind of the biggest difference. You'll see there are other investigations that are happening, but the ONC is going to be singular. You're going to have one report, and that's going to be it. The line of duty death, multiple agencies doing multiple reports, and we'll talk about what can come out of those reports. Two questions we got to answer. So for the ONC, it's what we have to answer on every single fire we investigate. Why did we have a fire? You know, it's, what's the first question that's normally asked after the fire's been put out? Any idea how it started, right? Um, so that's what we're doing for the ONC. Where did the fire start and why? Universal, whether it's a kitchen fire or an LODD. The ONC's purpose is to answer that question. The LODD is different. Why did firefighters die? That's the question that's trying to be answered with that investigation. You know, it's going to be an overview of equipment, of tactics, of operations, uh, of all of that. It's not telling you where the fire started. We're trying to give answers on why we lost firefighters. So those are the two biggest differences. And they'll run different courses. Uh, at certain points, one may be over faster, like in the case of the ONC, is usually over much faster than the LODD. And usually by the time you're leaving the scene, the ONC is at least pretty much done. The report may not be finalized, but at least there's an understanding from the investigators of what there is. The LODD can go on for months, even years, depending on which agency is doing it. So again, very short span for the ONC and a longer span for the LODD. So think about fire command. So we've got all of these predefined roles already with ICS. You've got command, you've got operations, you may have multiple areas of operations depending on how big of a structure you've got. So you've got different division leaders. You're gonna have staging where you have uh, personnel to come in and fill as people start to, start to fade out. You're going to have rehab and safety, but do you have somebody solely responsible on an LODD for investigation? And that's something you need to consider because when you see what all is going on, taking that one person and saying you're in charge of the investigation, they can take that role and then start doing all of the tasks that need to be done, assigning who's going to do the ONC, assigning who's going to start collecting the information for the LODD. Because again, one person can't do it. So the a big thing that we really like to push is having a person dedicated to be an investigation command. So the origin calls, you know, I said there were two investigations that were main, the LODD and the ONC. Let's talk about the ONC first, because it's going to pretty much be the same thing. Uh, it's just going to be on a grander scale than, you know, ruin contents fire. The best philosophy I give people, because you see it's ONC slash criminal investigation, if you start that ONC or that scene investigation with the mindset of it's a homicide, you're putting yourself in a better position. Uh, if it comes back and it's the investigation proceeds, if you get into something where, hey, it's a lightning strike or it's discarded smoking materials or whatever it is, you can always kind of ramp down and, and, and back off. But if you start out from moment one of treating it like it's a homicide, then you're in a position to do better because if you do treat it like, well, we, you know, we've got this bias and we think it's going to be a kitchen fire. And all of a sudden, you know, oh my goodness, look, we, we found multiple gas cans and multiple areas of origin. You know, it, it, it's very hard to ramp up. So if you start from moment one as a homicide, you're good. The other thing is team approach. Team approach is huge because of all the things that are going on, all of the steps that need to be taken for the ONC and all the steps that need to be taken for the LODD. There's a lot going on. You've got more than enough duties. So the more bodies you got that you can put for a task, the better off you're going to be. You know, immediately, just like you would on a traditional fire, start signing those roles. You know, hey, you're a photographer, grab your camera, go ahead and start taking pictures. Because not only are you documenting the scene, you're docu documenting the area, you're documenting where apparatus are positioned, equipment that's out and everything like that. So start assigning those roles as soon as you start to get bodies. 
Seeing security is huge. And not only for keeping the public or the media out, scene security is huge for the people in the scene, for the firefighters, the medics, whoever's inside the tape. I hate to say it, but I've been on one LODD where a firefighter wanted a memento and had grabbed a piece of equipment uh, that had been carried by the fallen firefighter and started to walk off till I saw him and we had to have a, a spirited conversation. So again, you have to lock all of that down because the gear that was on that firefighter, you know, it needs to be secured. Uh, all of the equipment, there needs to be an inventory of that truck. So scene security and locking everything down is very key. Again, uh, we're, we're gonna talk about body removal uh, fairly in depth, but if you can have this conversation so everybody knows it in the beginning, that body removal is going to happen as soon as possible. But we need to take all those document, uh, documentary steps, uh, do all of the, the mapping, the photographs, everything we need to do. We, we need to do that in a certain manner. So if you have that, because everybody wants to get them out as quick as they can, we've got to do our job first. Because again, we don't want to be that person that screws up a prosecution or uh, delays benefits. Again, locking down everything. That's key to both investigation. Uh, the gear, especially if it's a rescue, the gear that's coming off of them needs to be secured. The tools they were carrying, definitely their air packs or SCBAs and the, the apparatus of the affected one. So again, a lot going on that you need to get people to do. Other things and um, think about this, if it is a rescue situation, and that firefighter is being transported in an ambulance, somebody needs to go with them. Again, if stuff is coming off of them, you know, that needs to be secured and stored. Uh, if they're able to make any kind of statements, if uh, the medics are seeing something like, uh, hey, there's severe burning on this side, or uh, his gear smells like gasoline, you need to have somebody with them from scene until treatment, sticking with them. Uh, what you would also do on a normal scene, you, you got to talk to incident command. Again, everybody's hyped up. Everybody's really jacked. So a lot of times, you know, especially when the fire's out, the person's been transported, you know, everybody's still got that adrenaline running and they, they want to overhaul to the max. Well, hang on. We, we, we have a job to do for the fire investigation. So, you know, please leave the ceilings up. Please leave the walls intact. You don't have to rip everything out. Um, Taking a breath is huge because that scene is not going anywhere. These are going to probably be multi-day scene investigations. So everybody taking a breath. Uh, again, this is where having those predefined roles really helps people because they know what to do. They don't just start doing stuff because they do it. Um, one instance we had at an LODD was it was a rescue situation. And as the firefighter was coming out, obviously, uh, air packs coming off, get set to the side, turnout gears coming off, it gets set to another location. The fire was out, everybody was still really amped up and a firefighter comes along and sees an SCBA propped against the wall. And he sees it's empty, grabs it, takes it, fills it, gets it uh, air put back in it and is trying to get it back on the truck. And we went back to try to find where the fallen firefighter's air pack was because there's gonna have to be an examination of that piece of equipment. Well, it already been filled. So there was a lot of data that had been lost. And, you know, the person that did it didn't do it maliciously. It was done with good intentions, but it lost a lot of valuable data that we needed for our investigation. So that's why I'm saying everybody's got to take that break. The biggest time is that, that transition from suppression to investigation and kind of handling everybody's adrenaline and getting everybody focused on this is now what we're doing. Um, the grieving will start with the affected department, but the investigation as far as the scene needs to, to then be the priority, okay? Again, people will want to come. We all know fires are spectator sports. Uh, people want to come and see one of these events. So being able to deal with the public as they come, because I know in the South, everybody's bringing food. Um, they'll bring food to the scene, to the station, everywhere. And I'm sure that's probably universal across this nation. Uh, but you got to have somebody to help that, you know, people will want to come in and uh, offer all kind of support and everything. They just need to be directed to someone who's going to be able to handle that. And we talked about the ONC being singular. 
just as it is on everyone, we're going to have one report. It's going to be singular in nature. And who do you start with? I mean, when one of these happens, the Mayday's gone out. Uh, we know something bad has just happened. You got to start with the boots on the ground that are close to you. So especially for the, the locals, you know, those officers are already going to be on scene. Your detectives for your local sheriff's office or police department are going to be there a lot faster than probably a state agency or a federal agency. So, you know, you see everything needs to be locked down, crowd needs to be controlled, you need to start neighborhood cameras, start with the boots that are there first. The cavalry's coming, you just gotta wait time and hold on until we get there. So start with those local fire marshals, maybe some firefighters from another department. When you need those bodies, start with who's right there. Uh, you know, we always make fun of the wingtips on the detectives. Hey, they're great for going ahead and starting those witness interviews, getting a neighborhood canvas, getting a security video canvas, go ahead and get that running, secure that those data points before they can either leave or disappear or not be recorded or get recorded over. You want that information. So use who's closest to you. Then when you put out the word, obviously people will come. So if you've depleted or run out of resources on your local and state level, or on the local level as those state assets are coming in, again, same thing, start putting them to use. Uh, depending on, because this is kind of an overview, uh, it could be the state police, depending on where you're at, it could be the state fire marshal. I know some places there are two different entities, some places they're under one, and since this is kind of an overview uh, for the whole perspective, I couldn't give you specific, uh, but the state police, state fire marshal, maybe it's a wildland fire situation. You want to need state forestry. In certain states, the state medical examiner or pathologist will come out. So again, as those assets are coming in, put them to use, but don't forget about them, okay? So as they're coming in, they can go to work. And then we'll talk about ATF. So you know, obviously, Bill and I are both ATF CFIs, national response team members. So pretty much Every division in this country uh, for ATF has got a CFI. The National Response Team is also an option, as well as personnel out of in Cedar and Alabama. But those first two, your division CFIs and your NRT, are going to be a huge asset that's coming to you. And you think about it, this is kind of our distribution. Um, you know, it looks like we got about 8,000 CFIs in Pennsylvania and in Texas. Uh, we've got some states where we don't have anyone. You see that big uh, kind of open area in the middle. But the good thing about it is there should be somebody in your state. And that CFI can get to you, can go ahead and let management know that we may be spinning up an NRT and, and that's gonna bring in a number of resources. So CFIs across the country and, uh, well, something just popped up, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, you got those resources. So yeah, it may take them four hours to get there, that's fine. Just know they're coming and they can bring a lot of help. And speaking about the NRT, that's one of our NRT trucks on a scene. And you're like, what, what will the NRT bring? Well, we're going to bring bodies, obviously, first and foremost. So depending on the size of it, we'll bring a number, usually around 20 to 30. We can bring in, obviously, people to help with the scene. You know, just grab your gloves. Let's go dig. Um, usually, we talked about transparency early earlier. Uh, it, it's going to be an ATF CFI that's going to write the origin and calls that gets it off of the back of the local or even the state investigators where hey, we brought in a federal outside agency and they're going to be the ones to do that. We also bring fire protection and electrical engineers because again, very knowledgeable people and it's a specialty on these larger structures that you need to have somebody out. We, uh, for these call outs, we expedite our laboratory analysis. So when that's collected that day, it's sent to the lab that day and it's put at the front of the line. So as soon as it gets to the lab, it's run almost immediately. Um, the, the good thing about bringing in our engineers is if it is something where we have to do laboratory testing at our fire research lab, just outside of DC, they are there, they know what to collect, they know what to measure, they're up and running. And we also bring chemists, especially when we start talking about uh, collection of evidence, what samples do we need to take? What are we looking for? Is there some kind of reaction, some kind of chemical that's odd? Um, you know, the good old rainbow on the, the water that's flowing out. The chemist is going to look and make sure we're collecting in the right place and we're collecting the right thing. And obviously interview teams. So those last three, the digital forensics, financial forensics, th that's all lead driven. 
So we're going to bring bodies. So it's not just people digging that there's people to go out and interview those firefighters, those witnesses, owners, occupants, and all of that. So it's, it's a huge asset to be able to bring in because we all know that the affected department's going to, going to really be struggling. They need that help. Who else do you need to call? So depending on where you're at in the country, it's whether you have uh, a coroner or a medical examiner. I know in some places, the ME's office is full service. They come out, they don't want you to touch the body, move the body, do anything to the body. They're going, it's one-stop shopping. In other places, like what I've got in North Carolina, that's not happening. I mean, I'll have somebody come out and pronounce, but as far as getting that fallen firefighter uh, removed from that scene, that's going to be on my back. So know what your local is going to do and how that, that operation is going to work, how and who's going to remove the body from the scene and who's going to make that pronouncement. And the other thing is, yes, you need to have the conversation with them about the ruling and the manner of death. Uh, I, know, I know of several LODDs where the pathologist would not make a call until they were told the classification of the fire. You know, like you tell me it's incendiary, that it's an arson, then I'll go ahead and call it a homicide. But if you're telling me it's an undetermined, then I'm not going to make a call. So they kind of waited uh, for a lengthy amount of time to, to make and get a ruling out of that, that medical examiner. So just something to think about. The other thing is this, what are they going to do? Are they automatically going to do an autopsy or does it need to be requested? Are they going to do tox? The toxicology is big. Uh, I know in North Carolina, you have to request the toxicology. You must do it. So we built in redundancy, making sure multiple people ask for it. Because you're like, well, why would they need a toxicology uh, panel check? Well, it, it's happened before where a couple of firefighters, maybe volunteers or off duty, were at the local bar. The big one comes in. They're like, I, I can't sit here. We need to go help. And maybe they've had alcohol in their system when they were in fighting a fire and something went wrong. So again, that transparency, knowing what's going on, having all of the knowledge you can, it's important. So make sure you're asking for the autopsy and the toxicology. Now let's transition to the line of duty death investigation. You see it's plural there. You know, let's think about what is the line of duty death investigation? We talked about the question we're trying to answer is why did firefighters die? Who's going to do it? I mean, is it going to be the affected department? Is it going to be a uh, collection of departments around it. Uh, i give you an example on that. I know that in Virginia, when they have something like this or one of these events, the, they have, a, I think, a MOU already in place where neighboring departments and county officials will form a committee, and that committee will then do the LODD for that department, not the actual department itself. So is it going to be a state agency? Depends on where you're at. Is it going to be a federal agency? It's not going to be ATF. Our job will be to do origin and cause, but we will not do a line of duty death investigation. That's outside the scope of our duties. So understanding what that LODD is and who's gonna do it is very important. You're gonna see there's a number of investigations going on on this side of the house. Where the ONC was singular, this one is, depending on the agency, kind of all over the place. A number of people are doing it. Um, one of the key initial points that needs to be done in an LODD is those identifications and notifications. Again, when it happens, right there within minutes, obviously you need to let your chain of command know, you need to get somebody to that family to start being a liaison, but you need to start calling for help. You need the troops to be coming. So those notifications are huge. You know, the, the chief is gonna be busy. He's got to tend to, or her, he or her, has to tend to their department. So they need that PIO to handle the media horde. They need operations, that battalion chief or deputy chief, to go ahead and put the fire out. So start delegating those duties is going to be key for that chief. And pre-planning is going to be a big help. Everybody knows what their duties. So think about if you've got an LODD response team, if people already have defined roles, how much ahead of the game are you are. One recommendation I do make to people for the LODD side, I know certain states, they almost have kind of a clearinghouse where you call one agency and that agency will then make a multitude of notifications on your behalf. If that's the case, or if you're having to do those notifications yourself, there needs to be a master record. So who did you talk to? When did you talk to them? And what did they commit to doing? So are they gonna contact USFA? 
Are the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation? Are they con uh, contacting OSHA, the governor's office? So again, who you talk to, when you talk to them, and what they committed to. So you can go back and go, okay, who, who's, who, who notified OSHA? Oh, I know uh, OSHA was notified uh, within three hours, and this is the person who did it and who they talked to. So again, it's, it's a housekeeping thing that makes things easier later on. So beyond the local LODD, pretty much every state in the union has some variation of a Department of Labor or OSHA. Uh, I know there are some states, I think Wisconsin is one where if it's a public fire department, they will report to one agency. If it's a private department, they report to federal OSHA. But understand, there is going to be a regulatory body that is going to require a notification upon some injuries, but definitely a firefighter death. And they're going to start their own investigation. So know who your agency is. And the other thing is know who or know the time requirement. Some are within eight hours, they need to be notified. Some are 12, some are 24. So know who to call and how fast you need to call them. Because again, we don't want to take a chance on delaying benefits. The other thing is this, know if that agency, if it is initially an injury notification, what happens if a firefighter goes to the hospital badly burned and they pass a week later? Does that initial notification suffice or does there have to be a second death notification? So just know the policy of whatever the regulatory body is. And the other thing is this, the firefighters, do they have rights? I mean, you know, if I come in as a criminal case, there's gonna be Miranda rights. It's an internal investigation, there's their Garrity rights. But what about when OSHA comes, can they, must they be compelled to be interviewed by the regulatory body? Depends on where you're at, it's just something you need to know. They're gonna do their own investigation, okay? So again, it's another investigation that is occurring uh, in the majority of these locations. They are a regulatory body meant to protect workers. So they can invoke uh, punishment. They can levy fines. Uh, I, I don't know of an LODD where some kind of punishment or fine was never given. So that is, that's their job. They will issue their own report. And in most places I've seen that report is a public document. Why does that matter? We talked about attorneys who are going to sue. They are going to have access to that report and its findings and conclusions and who they uh, lay blame to. Okay, so that's going to come out of your Department of Labor, whatever your variation is for where you're at. Let's go up one more level. NIOSH. They are under the CDC. Yes, the same CDC that uh, told us what to do during COVID. I don't know if they think work is is it a disease or, or what, but NIOSH is tasked by Congress to investigate firefighter deaths. Unlike the regulatory agency, uh, the OSHA or Department of Labor, the reason NIOSH investigates is for the purpose of education. They want to learn so that if there's the, uh, something that can be done to prevent future fatalities, they can get that information out. So that's their basis of why they're doing uh, this on the federal level and it's under the CDC. And this is kind of their flow chart. Uh, again, they're going to have to be on duty deaths, but they're going to look at this death and break it into one of two categories. You see one side is going to be trauma and the other side's uh, cardiovascular. So they're going to ask these questions. So if you go over to the trauma side, you know, if an incident it resulted in a major injury or multiple deaths, yes, they're going to investigate. If not, was it related to a structure fire? If yes, you're going to investigate it. Uh, is it some, so they've got that whole, pretty much looks like they're going to investigate, which is what they're going to do, but they break it down into two different categories. Okay. As it kind of summarize what they do, it's got to be on duty. It's broken down into that traumatic or cardiovascular. They're going to do their own independent investigation. They're just not going to take OSHA's uh, or Department of Labor's and copy it and rubber stamp it. They too will issue a report of their findings. And yes, that is a public document, you can go onto their website. They use, they do not list a specific department, but what they'll do is on this state, in this state, maybe three or four firefighters died. Well, you know, that's an easy lookup that you can find out where it was. They do not levy fines or punishment. Again, 
their role is for prevention. They're looking to see what happened and can it pre be prevented in the future. So they're not going to give a fine or a punishment out. So that's what NIOSH. Other investigations that are going on um, for the origin and cause, just like on any insured property, the insurance or a private ONC investigator is, is going to be coming and doing their own independent investigation. I know on some life insurance policies that are carried by departments, if there's an LODD, the life insurance actually wants their own line of duty death investigation for they'll make a, a, a payout. And in the family or the family's attorney, uh, again, we, we talked about how things are uh, a big family and a big inclusive group of people. But sometimes those attorneys like, listen, we don't believe this department's being transparent and we want our own investigation to make sure those findings are right. So those are other ones that are going on. And then lastly, we've got the fifth branch of government, media. Um, firefighter fatalities are national events, okay? So it is going to garner a great deal of media attention. So this is why having that PIO, having that designated person to handle it is essential. Uh, I've seen chiefs and deputy chiefs and assistant chiefs, you know, just get in front of a camera and just start laying their soul open uh, as, as a part of grief. And that is not the forum or the venue to do it. You need to have that trained PIO who can get in front of them, who can, you know, share findings, answer questions while the command staff is tending to the fire department. Being able to handle that is huge. Uh, the media questions usually have a tendency to kind of mirror the investigation. So we talked about the ONCs, to, why did we have a fire? That's what the media is, why did we have a fire at this location where somebody died? And then over time, it's gonna change. Like, well, why did firefighters die? Who do we blame? So just be mindful that that transition is going to come the more time passes after the event. And they're also gonna usually be follow-up pieces. So on the one-year anniversary or two-year anniversary, the five-year anniversary, there's gonna be a revisiting of that event and going back over what happened and who was at fault and all of that. So again, have that PIO because that is gonna really be an essential tool. And lastly, union memberships. So depending on where you're at, I mean, we're gonna wanna interview obviously first in firefighters and May Day firefighters. So can they be compelled to talk? Because if someone from the LODD side is sitting with me, you know, they're wanting to know what orders were you given? What equipment did you have? Well, if that's going to lead to internal punishment, you know, very often union leadership will not allow their people to talk. And I mean, that's the whole purpose of having that protection. So you need to have those pre-plans. If we come in, I swear like ATF comes in and I want to interview first in firefighters, you know, am I going to be allowed to interview them? Yeah, must they be compelled? You know, who's going to sit in on that interview? What information is going to be sought? What questions are going to be asked? Because again, uh, if you compel somebody and then that ends up being used against them, I mean, everyone's got rights. Workers have rights. So that's a very key pre-discussion where you can have a lot of that mapped out and you're not having to do it right there at the time of the event. So here's just a few steps and uh, information on specific timing. We kind of break this down into what you need to do within minutes, what you need to do within hours, and what you need to do within the day. One of the biggest things, having those discover discussions, what we're going to do in a rescue or is it a recovery situation? Obviously, if it's a rescue, that's a priority. You want to get that fallen firefighter out and on the way to hopefully save their life. You're going to assign somebody to go with them because, again, stuff is going to be coming off of them. So as it's coming off of them, we want to be able to secure it so that we can examine it later. Um, I mentioned about the, the previous incident where somebody wanted a trophy, uh, the other incident where somebody filled a tank that they shouldn't. So, again, having somebody to be able to procure that is a very, very essential thing. It's going to be huge uh, later in the LODD. Okay. We also try to encourage uh, the rapid intervention teams that go in that if they know when they find somebody, if they can drop something and we can hopefully find it when we go in to do the semen examination, it helps the ONC side tremendously because very rarely is a firefighter where he should be uh, when we recover them. Uh, 
they, they get disoriented. They either lose the hose and, and go off from it. And we'll, we'll find like, why were they here? Uh, we want to make sure that we're documenting where they're, where they're found. Because when we document it at the end, we're going to go back in with a, a Tyvek suit. When we do that final set of pictures, uh, even if it's aerials, if the place doesn't have a roof, you know, we're, we're going to map out, here's where the, the hose was laid. Here's where the helmet was at. Here's where the body was at to give us a really good documentation. So if, if the writ can drop something, so I know, hey, uh, I dropped my ax or I dropped a halogen or something, I know where to look for. So when I find it, I know exactly where that firefighter was at. The other part is, is I think the most difficult decision that command has to make, that it's now a recovery, it's not a rescue. Uh, we don't wanna take a chance on losing people to try to get someone out because we know they're gone. So again, we're going to get, as scene investigators, we are going to get the fallen out as quickly as possible, but we want to make sure we've done complete documentation so that when we do remove them, that we've got everything that we need to document and it's done. So if we are going to court, I didn't rush somebody just to get them out. I documented every single piece of data that I needed to in the scene. Usually we tell people if it's on the body, it needs to go out. Um, in, in the body removal bag. But if it's not, if the helmets come off, leave the helmet, we'll get it. If the ear packs come off, we'll get it, okay? It does not all need to come out at that one time. Only those things attached to the firefighter need to be removed. And the other thing is this, is we know rarely do things burn during the day, they burn at night. And when things go sideways, it's usually at night. So we wanna work it in the daylight. We want the Lord's sunshine to illuminate us so that we can see everything we need to see and not rely on scene lights. Again, take a breath. The scene's not going anywhere. So what steps do we need to take? And I mentioned earlier about having an investigative command, that if you could do that and assign somebody, that takes it off of a command who can keep fighting the fire. That investigative person can go, okay, you're going to do my ONC, and you over there, you're going to be heading up the LODD. And everybody knows their predefined roles and what they need to start doing. So again, you're delegating, you're getting people on the path to what they need to do. And that's got two benefits. Number one, we don't want duplication. We don't need two people to do what one could do because uh, that's inefficient. We don't need that. The other thing, it keeps us from overlooking or missing something. Okay. So the person in charge of the LODD side of the house has their task that they need to do. The ONC person has their task that they need to do, and it, both are specialized, spe specializing in their own thing. So we don't overlook and we don't duplicate. For the ONC and the LODD, these are some things that we really encourage within minutes. Start it out, moment one is a homicide. If you do that, you're in a good position. If you need to back down, fine, but you're starting it as a homicide possible investigation. And you're going to start your traditional ONC, which you do on every one. Start photographs, begin your sketch, collecting your data, witness interviews, video surveillance uh, canvases, everything like that. But the key on this is the additional thing when we talked about multiple times, go ahead and assign somebody to be with the fallen as you're removed. So as things are coming off or those statements, there's somebody there to either document it or to procure that gear. The physical scene, okay? Not only just locking down the scene, locking down everything within that scene, because that truck's going to have to be inventory. Your gear's going to have to be inventory. Uh, you got an operations area that you're still going to have to fight fire in most cases. We need to keep the public and the bystanders out of the way. So locking down that scene is very important, as is the gear. You know, we need to lock down those air packs. We need to lock down the vehicle so that an inventory, we have to do a personal or a personnel accountability inventory, a PAR. So again, all of these things, and you see that's more than one person can do. All of these things need to, to be taken care of. And then we transition within the hour, you know, as especially when the fire, I talked about the big moment of transitioning from suppression to investigation is not just going in and overhauling it to the max. Uh, leave us as much scene as we can to investigate it. We're going to begin that photography, both of the scene. And if we had to put a Padron apparatus, so as, you know, trucks or engines or ladders, as they get pulled away to go be put back in service, you know, we want to know exactly where everything was at. And I've seen different departments doing it in different ways, whether it's marking the tire positions with uh, spray paint, 
uh, on the asphalt. Um, I've seen chalk used, but again, we want to document everything that's out there. When we start that sketch and, and our apparatus positions, and you talked about there's definitely two sets of firefighters I want to talk to. I want that first in. That's what we always do on a traditional ONC. What did you see? What did you encounter? Where did you see fire? What were you doing? Anything odd, you know, door barricaded or anything like that. And then uh, for the LODD side, it's going to be very important of the May Day. So if uh, you had a writ that had to go in, who was command, what uh, command, uh, what your orders were at that time, those are all going to be very important data points. And other things, as you get more and more troops that are coming to help, you know, go ahead and assign an evidence custodian so that if something is located, you know, if you've got a gas can in the front of the business, obviously that needs to be secured. Uh, and they, firefighters may still be fighting fire. So you want to get that evidence collected and out of the way. Chain of custody, so everything's nice and ready for court. As your uh, detectives and police officers are coming in, you know, they can do your witness identification and locations, your neighborhood canvases, your video canvases. And this is something else to think about. We want to secure some of the goods from the fallen firefighter. So someone is going to need to go back to the station and secure their locker, or if they've got a trunk or a storage closet, whatever they have needs to be secured. Their vehicle needs to be secured. Their mailbox needs to be secured. And you see, I'm saying secured, not that we're going to automatically do a search. Your search is going to have to be legal. But it's happened before where you know, a firefighter had um, some, some alcohol and would go out to the truck and have a couple of sips because they were fighting their demons. Um, that needs to be documented. It's a data point. So again, we, we want to document everything and that starts with securing their stuff back at the station. And then some of the last stuff, you've already made your uh, notifications. I need help to get those other investigators coming to you. If your medical examiner is one that likes to come out or if that's your, your uh, local policy, then definitely get them out. Again, we want uh, that toxicology because we want to make sure we're not delaying benefits. If you've got a accelerant detection canine, you want to go ahead and get them in route. That public information officer is going to, it needs to be right there immediately. So as cameras start to show up, they can go ahead and take corral of them. And then your legal understanding, because when you talked about these, they're going to probably be multi-days. So if it's going to be multi-day, then make sure you're on legal sound footing, okay? Uh, don't let exigency, I, well, we kept the truck there for four days. Well, exigency, remember, is the exception. Uh, a warrant or consent is the rule. So just make sure you maintain that legal authority to be present. I mean, this is stuff that's coming you know, after you get, you're going to bring in engineers, you know, dealing with utilities, dealing with a prosecutor if you've got an arson, uh, other stuff like heavy equipment. But by this point, you, you've got enough help there to, to make a difference. Whoop. So talking to the other side, the other question, why do firefighters die? That's the biggest question you need to ask yourself. Does your department have a line of duty death response team? Okay, because you're starting to see everything that's going on. And again, within minutes, set it ad nauseum, lock everything down. And if you can appoint an investigative command to go ahead and start dealing with all of this, you're way ahead of the game. Because again, command's got to put the fire out. You still got a fire that's got to be put out. So if you can delegate these tasks for the investigation, give that all, then command can still focus on the fire. And the big thing also is notifying. So notifying chain of command and notifying uh, that family and getting that family liaison on the LODD side of the house is huge. Absolutely huge. Um, some of the things you're going to need to do is, is you start to get more help in on the line of duty death side. You need a, a PAR. You're going to need to inventory that truck, everything that's on it. Some places required or not, I think it's a really great idea. Everything that was assigned to that firefighter, all of their equipment, so did they have any kind of specialized equipment? Were they missing anything? Had stuff they should not have had? Uh, what, what air pack? Because for the LODD side, if that's um, a Scott pack, Scott's going to want to come and look at it, okay? The um, FLIR cameras, anything like that, you want to know because maybe they did have a, a tick and it wasn't recovered. Well, now I know when I go into that scene and start looking for the tick because that's going to kind of help tell the story of what the firefighter was having to, to encounter. And then other little things like hydrants. Uh, did you have kind of some 
rare situation. Was it a fire during civil unrest or rioting? And it was there a very bad thunderstorm uh, where a lightning strike might be a possibility. Again, more data points that you need to take off and you need to make sure you've documented it. I learned this the hard way, that very first one uh, about securing radio traffic. So on one that I was present, um, radio traffic and 911 calls are public information. And I didn't think about that until I got a call from a district attorney that said the media was requesting all fire ground traffic and all 911 calls. And, and the last thing I wanted was for that to be put on the six o'clock news and that family have to hear the call for May Day. Uh, so that's when I learned. So know what your policy, your local policy is regarding fire ground traffic and communications and 911 calls. Um, we were able to get a court order to delay that for 30 days because number one, I didn't want the family to experience that right in that time. The other thing is I didn't know if it held um, information regarding a possible crime. We, we still hadn't done the scene examination, so I didn't want to take a chance on getting information out that might be needed for a prosecution. So know what your local pol policy is. Also, the training records, and that's going to pertain to when OSHA or a Department of Labor comes in, they're going to see what certifications did someone have, uh, how equipment was maintained, hydrostatic testing on, on bottles, things like that. They're going to want to see those records. So make sure, number one, your training officer is a super squared away person, not one of those, well, I'll update the folders next week and then I'll do it the next week, have that person squared away because those records are going to be very, very important. While the grieving department has to navigate a funeral, you still have fires to put out. So making sure you got that fire coverage, whether it's mutual aid or who's going to cover the station while you're going, especially those first days up until the funeral and even during the funeral that you've got that. We talked about having a location for our good Samaritans to come and help. So when they start bringing all that food, you know, they're going to the station uh, or going to town hall or city hall or someplace like that. They're not coming and getting in the middle of our scene. Uh, you want to make it a Department of Labor notification and other organiz organizational notifications but that'll come. So again, you want to do it as quick, but those first couple, the fire ground, the training records and mutual aid, very, very, very important. So kind of gets the things I want you to remember about this is both the ONC and the LODD, they're answering different questions. They'll have different longevities. Uh, just to remember that the ONC is why we had a fire and the LODD is why the fire fighters died. Um, they're going on simultaneously. Sometimes they will have overlap, but they are going to be happen. You know, that pre-planning is essential so that you don't make it up as you go or have somebody trying to lead who does not need to be leading. Everybody's got their own delegated task that they can immediately jump on because we want that justice. If it's an arson and it's a murder, we want to make sure that surviving family gets their benefits and we don't want to be accused of doing anything and not being transparent. So if you can manage that, uh, start triaging the things you need to do set your task like this is what we need to do within minutes, hours, and in days, kind of like I've done in this presentation. You see, it'll kind of help you as you navigate what you need to do. So we talk about some additional resources because every place is different. Some places have more, some places have less. These additional resources, the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, you see a 1-866 number, a toll-free number, the PSOB, um, number for them. These are notifications that are going to need to be made when when ready to. But the National Association of Fallen Firefighters, their web page is just loaded with SOPs, guidelines, go-bys, protocols. It's a host of information that you can look and incorporate what you need to for your local agency. So I wanted to make sure you knew about that resource. The U.S. Fire Administration put out, uh, it's a little bit dated, you see it's 2008, but it's a firefighter autopsy protocol so that that pathologist or the investigator helping that pathologist kind of knows what needs to be done. We talked about the autopsy and toxicology. I think it's uh, about uh, over 100 pages, but it's a very, very good document to give you some, some guidance on what needs to be done on that so that nothing gets missed. And then there's also a CFI trainer 
www.nad.net. You see investigating fire and explosion incidents involving an LODD. Uh, very good program, kind of gives you the same perspective of some things that are going on and need to be covered and taken care of. Uh, it also talks about the importance of you know, mental health and making sure that uh, that's taken care of for both the grieving department and the investigators. So again, great resources. Uh, I think it's you get three credit hours for it. It is tested material and it's, it's very great information. So uh, again, I, I wanted to thank Bill for uh, extending the invitation and giving me this opportunity. That right there is my email address, darren.solomon at atf.gov. Please reach out when I go in and do this for specific states or departments. Uh, it, it's a more intricate presentation because I try to include information so that if you're in Wisconsin, you know exactly who to call in Wisconsin for state help or for OSHA or for all of that. So this has been more of an overview. Uh, if you have any questions or anything like that, that I can ever help with or uh, anything on, on this topic, please, please don't hesitate to reach out because I, if I can't give you an answer, I'll try to find one that, uh, that, that suits the bill. So thank awesome. you. Bill. Hey, Darren, thank you so much. Um, as everyone knows, you can now go on to Dakari's uh, website um, where you've seen this presentation and go over to the, uh, the test tab. And uh, Darren's going to give me a few questions and we'll uh, make this uh, tested training um, available to, to anyone. So if you want Darren to come out and talk to you, uh, reach out to him. So Darren, thank you so much, buddy. Thank you, Bill.